Okay, so today we are going to look at the concept of uh, nucleic acid, which is DNA. So, Frederick Mister is the first scientist that was able to study the nucleic acid material in the year 1869. He's a German scientist. And then he's the first scientist that was able to isolate it, the so-called nucleic nuclein because the nucleic acid was actually first named as nuclein and uh, this nuclein was first isolated from a fuel cell and then the nucleic acid material or the nuclein was actually shown to have acidic properties and these acidic properties were actually been discovered by a scientist called Robert Cosal Robert Cosal in the year 1881. He was able to identify, or he was able to demonstrate that nucleic acids, or this nuclein have nucleic acid properties. And as a result of that, it is now renamed as nucleic acids. So that is how it started. It was first named nuclein, and then it is isolated from the fuse cell and because of its acidic properties, it's later named as nucleic acids. And these acidic properties were demonstrated by Robert Cosal in the year 1881. So the nucleic acid materials are, or the nucleic acid are of two types, which is deoxyribonucleic acids, abbreviated as DNA, and the ribonucleic acid, which is also abbreviated as RNA. So, what are the distribution of these nucleic acid in a cell? What are the distribution of this nucleic acid in a cell? The DNA is found in the nucleus. The DNA is found in the nucleus, and with a small amount are found in the mitochondria and the chloroplast of plants. So that means that in a cell, we have three different components where these DNA are found. You can either found in the nucleus, mitochondria, and chloroplast. But remember in animals, we don't have chloroplast. So therefore, in animal cell, DNA is found only in the nucleus and mitochondria. But the amount of DNA in mitochondria and chloroplast is small, it's very small, while the RNA, the RNA is found throughout the cell. It means that it's found everywhere in a cell. Everywhere in a cell you can find RNA. So, and then, what are the evidence that DNA is a genetics material? The DNA is a genetics material of organisms, and evidence is present in all cells and mostly restricted to the nucleus. A small amount found in chloroplast and mitochondria. And the amount, the amount of DNA in somatic cells, somatic cells, of course, we have two types of cells based on their uh based on their source, we ha can have body cells and we have uh, sex cells. So the amount of DNA in somatic cells, which is the body cells of a given organism is constant, similar to the number of chromosomes. It means that if you have 46 chromosomes, the number of chromosomes is constant across human, across any given species, like in humans, we have 46 chromosomes. In chimpanzee, we have 48 chromosomes. In Drosophila melanogaster, they have eight chromosomes. So this number of chromosomes remain the same for all, for all species, for all species. So for example, if in humans, we have 46 chromosomes, it means that all humans have 46 chromosomes. And if in Chimpanzee, we have 48 chromosomes. It means that in chimpanzee, all chimpanzees have 46, 48 chromosomes. 
So it's also similar in the case of DNA. So the number of, or the amount of DNA in somatic cells is the same for all body cells, it's the same. But in the case of the somatic cell, the number of DNA or the DNA content of gametes, that is the sex cells, is half that of the somatic cells. So in somatic cells, in humans, we have 46 chromosomes. But in the sex cells, that is palm cell, is only 26, 23 chromosomes. And also in the sperm cell is 46 chromosomes. And that is why if you have fertilization, because the DNA, sorry, the chromosomes in in somatic, sorry, in sperm cell is 23. Also in the excess is 23. So when you have fused them together, that is true fertilization, a zygote is formed. And that zygote will also have 46 chromosomes because those three chromosomes are coming from the mother, while the 23 chromosomes are coming from the father, which is from the egg cells and the sperm cell. So therefore, the DNA content in gamete cells is, uh, is half that of the somatic cells. So it's similar because this DNA is there tightly wrapped in the DNA, sorry, in the chromosome. So the number of chromosomes also is strong. The number of chromosomes and the DNA are reflecting the same thing. Because if you have the half number of chromosomes, in the sex cells, of course, the DNA will also be half. So in the case of polyploidy, that is when you have organisms, polyploidy means when you have a multiple set of chromosomes. So the DNA content increased by a professional factors. And then the mutagenic effects of light peaks at two at 253.7 nanometer. And that is actually the, the, the peak, that is the wavelength of the maximum absorption of DNA. So that is why even in the laboratory, if you want to measure the concentration of the DNA, of course, we have a law that actually talk about the bias and numbered law, which is absorbance is equal to molar extension coefficient concentration times part length. So you can easily get the you can by knowing the absorbance by knowing the absorbance of uh, the DNA which is the nucleic acid material as two hundred because it's usually approximated in some textbooks you see that it is two hundred and sixty nanometers. So if you know the absorbance of the DNA, of course from there you can manipulate to know the concentration of the DNA from a particular given samples. Okay. So now we are going to look at the structure of the structure of of nucleic acids. So nucleic acid are fully nucleotides. When we said fully nucleotides, it means that they are the building blocks of nucleotides. So the nucleotides are what actually produce the nucleic acids. So nucleic acid is a fully nucleotide. Let's say this one is one nucleotide. And let's say this one is another nucleotide, and this one also is another nucleotide. So how do we get the structure of this nucleic acid? These nucleotides usually join together through phosphodiester bond. They join together through phosphodiester bond to form polynucleotides. So one nucleotide joins with another nucleotide through what we call phospho, that is P, D, B that is post for the ester bond. So one nucleotide joined with another nucleotide through post for the ester bond in a five prime, three prime direction. So we also need to also look at the concept of central dogma of molecular biology. The concept of central dogma of molecular biology starts from the point of DNA. So generally, DNA convert itself to another copy or DNA copy itself through a process called replication. And this DNA also transcribes 
or copy itself into what we call a messenger RNA. And the major enzymes that are responsible for doing that is RNA for polymerase, and the process is called transcription. So when you have DNA copying itself to produce a messenger RNA or, a, or RNA, so the process is called transcription. And the major enzyme that does the work is RNA polymerase. So also at the same time, the RNA can also copy itself back into a molecule of DNA. So DNA can transcribe or can be actually converted back to DNA and the process is called reverse transcription. So you see RNA to DNA is called reverse transcription. And then of course the RNA can also convert itself into uh, a protein and the major factory where this RNA is converted into protein is uh, ribosome. So ribosomes is like a protein manufacturing industry. This is the industry where proteins are synthesized by using RNA as a raw material. So RNA is a raw material for the synthesis of the protein by the ribosomes in the cytoplasm in the cytoplasm. So now, the next thing we are now going to look at the components. What are the components of these nucleotides? So nucleotides are made of, of three major components. So the first component, we have one, we have phosphates. And second, we have sugar. And this sugar, can be ribose sugar or deoxyribose sugar. And as we are going on, we'll see the difference between ribose sugar and deoxyribose. And then the top component of the nucleotide is base. So we have phosphates, we have sugar, and then we have base. And this base is divided into two. It's divided into two. We have A, purines, and B, we have pyrimidines. And these purines are made up of adenine and guanine. While for the pyrimidines, we have cytosine, thymine, and uracil. So first, if we have sugar, if we have this sugar together with base or linked with a base, they produce what you call nucleosides. So we should understand that the difference between the nucleotides and nucleosides, the nucleosides is just a combination of sugar and base. But for the nucleotide is the combination of all the three. The combination of all the three will give us the nucleotides. So when you have phosphates, you have sugar, you have base, you have nucleotides. You have nucleotides. If you have sugar, phosphate, and base. But if you have only sugar and base, you have nucleosides. We have nucleosides. Okay. Okay, so now we are going to look at this, the structure of these bases. So these are the organic bases. So we are starting with purines. Remember from the previous slide, we said that we had bases and these bases are made up of purines and pyrimidines. So the first thing that you need to put at the back of your mind is that what is the main difference between purines and pyrimidines? If you look at the purines here, it has, they have two rings. They have two rings. This is the first ring here, and this is the second ring. So if you see that in the case of furines, they have two rings. But for the furimidines, they only have one, one ring. So now, how do we define these organic bases? Of course, they are heterocyclic compounds. When you said heterocyclic, it means that they are the compounds that have other atoms in the rings. 
apart from carbon and hydrogen. So what are the other atoms that are found in these organic bases? Of course, they have nitrogen. They have nitrogen. So nitrogen are found in the rings. So that is why they are called heterocyclic compounds. But for the homocyclic compound, a compound that have just pure carbon, just pure carbon and hydrogen in the ring. But for the heterocyclic, it means that apart from the carbon and hydrogen, also other atoms are found. So that is why here, if you look at the furans or the organic bases generally, they have other atoms. And these other atoms are nitrogen, so they are found in the ring. So that is why they are considered as a heterocyclic compound. And one very interesting thing is this. In organic chemistry, we have three types of compound based on the position of the double bonds. So if you have compounds that have a single bond, double bond structure, maybe alternative form of single and double bond, look at it here. If you have, you see between this and this, you have single bond and between this and this, you have double bond. So when you have alternative form of single and double bond, those kind of compounds are classified as aromatic, sorry, they are classified as a conjugated compound. They are considered as conjugated. So any compound that are conjugated, any compound, any compound that are conjugated, that are conjugated, any compound that are conjugated, it means that they have alternative form and single bond, and they are said to undergo resonance. They are said to undergo resonance. And those kind of compounds can be absorbed in the visible lights. They can be absorbed in the visible lights. So that is why generally organic compounds, sorry, this organic, because of the presence of this organic basis, DNA, DNA and RNA, DNA and RNA absorb at 260 nanometer. 260 nanometer. And this is actually due to the presence of these bases. And it is because of this conjugated nature that are present in these bases. That is why DNA and RNA are absorbed at 260 nanometer. So that is for this. And for the few meetings, as I said, they have all these single, single ring. And of course, if you just look at all of them, the only differences between one is that it's just the position of amino group and then carbonyl group. So you see in the case of cytosine, you have amino group here, but you see in the timing, the amino group is not longer here, but methyl group is attached here. So you see timing, timing is only found in DNA. We should put this at the back of our mind. Timing is only found in DNA and uracil is only found in RNA. So it means that there is no uracil in DNA, and there is no timing in RNA. So we should know this. So now the next thing that we are going to look at is 